Yeah, today uh, Matt is going to be continuing our series on uh, creation. Uh, this is uh, part four, and he's going to be uh, focusing particularly on these uh, ideas of, uh, of renewal. Um, and as part of that, uh, he's uh, asked me to read from uh, Second Peter uh, chapter three. And so uh, I'm going to ask uh, Greg to uh, stick it up. There we go. And uh, we'll read through that now. This is from the RSV translation. First of all, you must understand this, that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and indulging their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They deliberately ignore this fact, that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and an earth was formed out of water and by means of water, through which the world of that time was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the godless. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance." But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. It's a little bit dire. Hopefully it's going to get better soon. Since all these things that have dissolved in this way, I'm not getting better yet, uh, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which Heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Uh, Morning, everyone. Uh, Again, welcome to our Sunday morning service. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Just in case we haven't met, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the leaders here at MCC. This is part four of a series that we began earlier uh, in the year, looking at the subject of creation care. So over the course of the last couple of months, we've looked at uh, a bunch of ideas around creation, such as um, the innate goodness of creation. So um, the fact that creation is good in and of itself, because God, the creator, deems it or judges it as being good, innately good, regardless of any greater purpose that it serves for humans. So we looked at that. Uh, we looked at our, our place as humans in relation to the rest of the created order. So we looked at the fact that we are creatures, we are fellow creatures, but at the same time there is something different and distinct about human creatures. That is, we're made in the image of God as opposed to the other creatures, and we've got a bunch of unique responsibilities towards or for the rest of creation as well, having been made in God's image. And last week... We looked at the interconnected uh, relationship, or if you like, the kind of the intertwined fate, if you like, between humans and the rest of creation, and some of the detrimental effects that humanity has had on the rest of creation through history. So that's uh, a quick summary of where we've been um, so far. This morning, for part four, I want to look at a pretty unique and specific issue that is related to creation care. Now, the risk is that this this topic may almost sound like it's really niche and academic. But I think, and I'm going to argue, that it's actually very important for all of us in relation to how we go about treating the rest of creation day by day. So I'm going to try to pitch the problem in two ways, if you like, two ways. So first of all, I'm going to present the problem or the issue as an idea, and then I'm going to try to illustrate it via a story, if you like. So so here's, here's the problem as an idea or the issue as an idea. I think, regardless of how much someone acknowledges that creation is good, that it has innate worth, despite how strongly someone may believe that they have a God-given responsibility to care and cultivate creation, the same person who believes those things will find it incredibly difficult to act, to act in a manner consistent with those beliefs if they also believe that God is eventually going to destroy all that creation and begin again. That, I think, is the issue or the problem. So to put it another way, 
imagine that you're young, if you have to imagine that you're young. <laughs> and you've got, a, uh, you've got a rich, distant uncle, and he gives you a house. So this is a fairy tale, obviously, right? So he gives you a house. And the house is like a 1900s hydro house. So, you know, it's weatherboards and asbestos. But it provides you with shelter. You like it. It's your first ever house. It's special. And the rich, distant uncle tells you repeatedly, look, this place has character. It's got personality. It's worth something beyond the fact that it keeps you dry and warm. They don't make them like this anymore. It's got a innate worth, so look after it and keep up the maintenance. That's what he tells you. And you think, okay, well, like, that sounds good. And that sounds logical. It's consistent as well. And it provides me with a logical, consistent motivation to look after the place. But then the same rich uncle comes back and adds, look, by the way, sometime in the future, we're going to bulldoze this shack down and build something really good in its place, Okay. I'd suggest that that will cause some cognitive dissonance. So on the one hand, it's saying creation is good, the shack is good, we need to care for it. But you're also telling me that it's going to get scrapped and replaced by something in the future. I think it's going to be difficult to consistently act in a way that's good for the rest of creation if I suspect in my heart of hearts that creation is going to be done away with and replaced anyway. And not just replaced by anyone, but replaced by God, no less. Now, does that make sense so far? That's painted the picture, okay. So that's the issue and the problem that we'll be looking at today. And I'm going to, again, argue that it's a real problem because there are parts of Scripture that can be easily and understandably read as teaching that creation will be, in fact, destroyed and replaced. And there have been numerous famous and popular Christian books and movements that have also peddled the idea that creation is inevitably going to be brought to the brink of destruction, if not, entire, if not entirely destroyed. And that kind of idea can breed a lot of pessimism. So this is an example from the 70s, the late great planet Earth sold millions and millions and millions of copies. And in more recent times, the, the entire Light Left Behind series. Again, a lot of people believe this, and at least on face value, it looks plausible from what we read in Scripture. That passage that Tim read out before was a good example and it's a reference it's a regular reference that people who believe this line go back to and quote so why bother being good stewards when the whole thing is just going to burn anyway and just as importantly why I think this is an issue it can be a barrier for people exploring Christianity if they've done their homework they would have come across these passages and these ideas and if they have any kind of environmental conscience, they'll be asking questions about the fate of creation. What does the Christian God have planned for it? So this issue, it matters. So today we'll be looking at it in three parts. Firstly, is creation as we know it going to feature at all in the next age? And when I use the term next age, I mean the, the age that's going to be inaugurated by Jesus' return to earth and the kingdom of God being fully and finally ushered in. That's what I mean by next age. So will creation somehow feature in that next age? And then the second part, assuming that it is going to feature, how? How will it feature? How will that come about in the next age? And lastly, what may some possible implications be? So that's where we're going today. Okay, so the first thing. Is the rest of creation, as, as in besides humans, going to be included in the next age? I think so. But like humanity, it needs to change in order to exist in that next age when Jesus returns and the kingdom of God is fully realised. It needs to change because, as we saw last week, creation is currently compromised. So that passage from Romans that we looked at mentions it being in bondage to decay with a promised future of liberation and freedom so it's going to be able to eventually um, be its full and true self and glorify God completely but that's all just from that one passage in Romans is there anywhere else in the New Testament that mentions creation in the next age well there's Paul's relatively famous term new creation new creation 
It's surprisingly only used twice in the New Testament that I could come across, and both times by Paul. But commentators argue that when he uses that term, he includes in its scope creation going beyond humanity. So they argue that when Paul says, talks about a new creation, it encompasses all of creation. And they, they infer this from Paul's likely being influenced from this um, idea going all the way back in the Old Testament to Isaiah, where he talks about God's new thing in chapter 43, verse 19. And in that passage from Isaiah, God's new thing, like new creation, includes a new heaven and a new earth. And we can find a New Testament parallel in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 20. In that famous passage that talks about all things, all things being reconciled by and to Christ, including creation. So it's not just humanity. Now, we don't want to pretend that all the details are known, but there seems to be, just on this basis alone, there seems to be an important place for creation in the next age. However, that begs the big question of how. How is that going to come about? What may it look like? So here's our second question and point. How will creation be included in the next age? So broadly speaking, there are two main camps when it comes to this. Two main camps. There's the, um, there's the idea of the current creation being destroyed and replaced. And then there's the second camp of the current creation being renewed and restored. So the second camp of renewal and restoration argues that there will be some kind of continuity between the current old creation and the new creation of the next age. It'll be renewed and restored. But what's a little frustrating is that there seems to be only three sections of scripture that deal with this subject in the New Testament. There's a passage from Romans that we looked at last week, Romans chapter 8. And then there's 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 3 to 13, which Tim read out before, and Revelation, chapter 20 and 21. And like I said before, at first glance, that passage from 2 Peter and the passages from Revelation can seem to completely land on the side of creation being destroyed and then replaced. So it's good to go through these passages slowly and thoroughly to try to unpack what they may mean. Okay, so beginning with 2 Peter chapter 3, which is that passage that Tim read out before, you might remember that in verse, th- verse 13 it names up the end goal, the end goal of new creation. And that is, it's described as a place where righteousness can dwell. Righteousness. So righteousness, justice, and right relationships between human and human, human and creation, and human and God. Relationships that are characterized by love. They're in right relations. So to reach this state, evil and sinfulness need to be judged and eradicated. And here's the important point. Evil and sinfulness need to be judged and eradicated. Not creation itself, which instead needs to be redeemed and set back to its original purpose. So that's the first big point. But again, that seems hard to reconcile with verses like um, verse 7 in that same passage where it talks about the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire. Reserved for fire. That's from the NRSV version. And the term fire or ablaze are also mentioned in verse 10 and 12. And this is pretty heavy. Again, like, this is pretty serious language. So it's worth remembering in the Old Testament, that would have been the background context for this passage, fire is regularly associated with judgment, often at the end of history. And critically, again, this judgment is only concerned with people, not the rest of creation. And you get more evidence for this by that concluding phrase of the verse, destruction of the godless, which again suggests that the context for fire and the fire of judgment is people, not creation. And a lot of commentators stress that this is imagery, it's poetic imagery, not to be taken literally, Instead, the point is that it's emphasising God's inevitable judgment and its earth-shattering nature and consequences. In verse 10, that fire imagery is coupled with the term elements. So it talks about elements melting or dissolving with the heat. And that, again, first pass, first glance, it sounds like destruction, doesn't it? Elements melting in the heat. 
But commentators have pointed out that the Greek term stoichia, which is translated elements, can have multiple meanings. So elements may mean the sky and heavenly bodies. It may mean the essential building blocks of creation. It may also refer to the existing world order. So the element, if it's the existing world order, is going to melt. It's going to dissolve. And really importantly, melted or dissolved is not the same thing as destroyed. Not the same thing as destroyed. It's changed, but it's not destroyed, as in it's not done away with. Again, also, if you were arguing for the destroyed camp from verse 10, we read in some translations that the earth and everything that is done on it will be burned up. And this is like another big dilemma. What do we mean by burned up? More recent translations instead say things are disclosed, or they say things are laid bare, or they say that things are exposed, or found, or even made manifest. And that, those, that cluster of meanings seems to correspond well with the early idea in verse 10 of the earth, of the elements being burned up to reveal, to reveal things, reveal what's been done on the earth, the deeds done on the earth. Once they're revealed, they're revealed for God's judgment. So I personally think on balance, I think that these translations are more consistent with the immediate context of this passage. And the immediate context of this passage is people's deeds being exposed to God's righteous judgment. It's more about that than the idea of being literally burned up. But nevertheless, the idea of destruction, being destroyed, also translated dissolved, is mentioned across 11 and 12. Um, but interestingly, and this is the last point in this section, the New Testament Greek term opaleia, that is rendered or translated destroyed, or destroy, can also mean no longer useful or fit for purpose. Or it can mean something's been reduced to its components. And again, this is significantly different from what we tend to mean when we use or think of the notion of utter destruction. And really critically on this point, in verse 6 of this same passage, the author quotes the great flood of Genesis in verse 6. And crucially, even in this catastrophic judgment event, the entire earth wasn't destroyed. The earth survived, and neither was all creation annihilated. So I know this is heavy going, but I'll stop there and just put it all together and say to summarise, although this passage from 2 Peter can first appear to be supportive of the complete destruction model of new creation, especially in some translations, particularly in some older translations, hopefully you can see that when it's examined really carefully, it can go just as strongly the other way, towards that second camp of a restored continuation model of creation. Because what's being judged and possibly destroyed are things like humans, evil, etc. And what may be meant by the term of the elements um, or built, may mean building blocks or the current created order. And destroyed, again, that term is open to, to different meanings. There's a good chance it means something like laid bare, exposed, not fit for purpose or not in its entirety. So it's not as simple, if nothing else, please take away, it's not as simple as reading this and saying, okay, this clearly means that everything as we know it is going to be utterly destroyed by fire and replaced. It's not that simple. If you want to look at it from a slightly more, I guess, philosophical perspective, the complete destruction model also runs into problems. Because when you think about it, the often unarticulated reason behind the necessity of destroying creation would seem to involve our human sin leaving some kind of stain or blemish on the substance of creation. And the only way to get rid of this stain or blemish is to destroy creation and start again. And that sounds, again, plausible, right, at, at, at first blush. But what is the substance or the essence of creation beyond a vaguely kind of, I don't know, um, mystical notion? Like we've covered and talked about multiple times, creation is still inherently good, albeit it's suffering and it's compromised. But as mentioned last week, it's suffering and it's compromised because of humans, because of our actions, because of our deci uh, decisions. It's not as if creation itself has a sinful soul 
or is somehow beyond redemption. And if that's true, why is there any good reason for God to destroy it? Does that make sense? Why would he? Because it hasn't done anything wrong and it doesn't have some kind of, again, tarnished or corrupted soul because of what we've done. Okay, so that's the first big passage and that's some ideas to try to articulate again two camps, destruction and complete recreation or a continuation over here where things are redeemed and restored. When I put this sermon out to the others to have a look at and the preaching team, someone helpfully got back to me and said, that's a lot of time going through some pretty heavy passages. You should probably think about trying to put in some, like, some kind of interlude about now, some, you know, some kind of contrast, some kind of respite from all this heavy teaching. So I thought, what's something that's related to creation that gives me a sense of calm? Like you know, when I'm really under it and when I'm feeling stressed out by all this work. And I thought, whatever brings me calm should probably bring other people calm as well. So this is what I came up with. <laughs> So, so this is a good, this is a good like, little example because it does tie into what we're talking about. When you're talking about current creation, moving into new, new creation, it does raise the idea of what happens to our beloved pets. Yeah? What's going to happen to the animals, to our fellow creatures that we have relationships with, that we've bonded with? What's going to happen to them in the next age? Plenty of people have argued, and I don't think you can come up with a conclusive opinion on this whatsoever. It's all conjecture. But I think most of us would like the idea that again, in some shape or form, our beloved animals and pets will also be redeemed. They won't be completely destroyed and just replaced by new ones. So, um, you know, anything about it, you know, the virtues of faith, hope and love, and love being the ultimate, and love being everlasting in nature. So you like to think that on some level, the loving relationships we have with other creatures will also continue through eternity. So this is a picture of my dog, uh, Wilson, who I love. Um, I mean, in my eyes, he's already perfect. I don't know how he could be improved on or redeemed, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but again, that's just, that's just something else to think about. Okay, so uh, that's the interlude. Back to the last patches. This one won't take as long. But, and again, it's important. Um, I know it would be easy to dodge these, heartful bits of, uh, these harder bits of Scripture, but I think we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to people who are exploring Christianity and ask good questions, and we owe it mostly to God to be able to have some kind of response or understanding as to these really difficult passages and what they may mean. So this is another doozy from Revelation. Revelation. Um, you probably, be, some of you will be familiar, I think, with this one here from chapter 20, verse 11. It contains the line that heaven and earth fled from his God, as in God's presence, the great white throne of judgment, and there was no place found for them. So the context is, again, God's righteous judgment and be in God's presence. And so this, this line here, this verse, could be read as being consistent with the idea of destruction. Earth and heaven fled. There's no place for them. However, it's probably simpler to interpret it to conclude that it speaks to the fear and the awe that will come about when confronted by God and his righteous judgment, his prospective righteous evaluation. It's so awe-inspiring and maybe even terrifying that all of us, all of creation, want to get out of there. But you can't hide from it. No place was found for them. You can't dodge God's judgment. That's another interpretation. The other famous passage is in chapter 1, verse 1 of Revelation. It famously speaks of the first heaven and the first earth having had passed away and had been contrasted with a new heaven and earth. And again, this could understandably be read as current creation being destroyed and replaced. But in context, it's more likely to mean passed out of sight or departed. So that's the first thing. And secondly, the Greek term here that is translated in English new, so new earth, it's kainos as opposed to neos. And that matters because kainos denotes renewed as opposed to neos, which means totally new. Understand? So the Greek here, which we translate new, is kainos, and that actually means more accurately renewed, as opposed to another Greek term that's not used here, which is neos, which means totally new, completely new. And then finally, from Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we have the famous quote, I'm making everything, everything slash all things new. I'm making everything slash all things new, which sounds consistent, again, with the destruction of the old creation. However, I'm making everything new is a very different sentiment than I'm making new things. 
I'm making everything new, is very different from the idea of I'm making new things. So I'd argue that John, the author's point here, is more about renewal than destruction. So to sum all of this up, scriptural evidence from 2 Peter that Tim read out before and Revelation, a couple of passages that we looked at there, especially when coupled with Romans 8 and the Old Testament, I think speak to creation in the new age, having a place and being transformed. It'll be a transformation of the current creation. That's what I currently believe. And this redemption and renewal of creation is significant because it points back to God's original declaration that creation was good, worthwhile. It has innate value. So going back to my original example, this would suggest that reality is the equivalent of that distant and rich uncle giving you the old house that is far from perfect but is still good and ask you to look after it and treat it well because it's good. But consistent with looking after it now, he's eventually going to restore it. He's going to make it even better. Or if it helps, think about our renewed human bodies in the next age. Jesus, who was fully human, had a renewed body after his resurrection. And we promised the same. Jesus' renewed body was different from his old pre-death body but critically there was still something recognizable about Jesus's resurrection body there was some somehow there was some continuity between his body before and after resurrection does that make sense so there's a principle there of again things not being completely new but redeemed restored if you like improved but still some degree of recognizable continuity there And again, this makes sense as we're told in the New Testament that our bodies and what we do with them matter. It's another example of God caring about creation. Okay, Um, A couple of quick, quick things just to think about in light of all this. First of all, these ideas are argued about, they're contested. Those two camps are believed by people who are faithful Christians on both sides. So I don't want anyone walking out of here thinking this is a cut and dried, simple issue. It's not. It's not. So... Again, I would personally argue that it's important to have an answer for now that is maybe tentatively held, if that makes sense. It's good to have a response when people ask you questions about what does your God think and plan for creation in the next age. I think it's good to have some response to that. That's the first thing. Secondly, we talked about how if you believe the whole thing is going to be um, done away with, annihilated and something new is going to be put in its place it's easy to get pessimistic and fatalistic in the face of that about how we currently treat creation i think it's just as easy to get passive about our stewardship of creation now because we think like it doesn't matter because god's going to fix it up and renew it anyway so this is not an excuse if you believe this the idea of restoration and renewal again just to get passive and take the hands off when it comes to stewarding creation instead it's a call a repeated call to partner with god and participate in his renewing of creation starting from here and now but that also leads to the final question what kind of people can partner with god and that gets back to that passage that tim read where peter asked that very question given all of this what kind of people should you be and his answer godly and holy godly and holy people and this is important because he doesn't say listen just be more environment just be more environmentally conscious he doesn't say that and he certainly doesn't say just try your hardest to be a better person and a more moral upright person instead he says godly and holy that is holy a people distinct set apart by god for a specific purpose to be a witness in terms of how we live collectively and godly not just more moral but someone who is indwelt with the Holy Spirit and who is being transformed from the inside out. So instead of being worried and scared, being someone who trusts God, instead of being someone who's deluded by pride and thinks that they can strut around this world like ultimately it's theirs, no, someone who's humble. Instead of someone who's worried and scared because they only see scarcity when they look around, someone who's generous because they believe in a God of loving abundance and ultimately not someone who's simply chasing pleasure or status and willing to kind of pillage the natural resources in order to meet those ends but someone who is loving who loves god and people that's the kind of people that we're called um, to be 
So we need, again, to be renewed humans in order to better look after a renewed creation. So let's pray for that. Father, um, once again, I thank you for uh, your word, your revealed word in Scripture. And I pray that um, you will help us when it comes particularly to tricky passages like this. Help us be um, humble and dependent on you and your spirit and the gifts that you've given us around our intelligence and our cognitive capabilities and all the resources that have come down from the past. Help us, help us be, um, again, uh, diligent, hard workers when it comes to grappling with these ideas, but also people who have the humility to know that ultimately we can't be 110% sure about something like this, but we need to hold it tentatively and we need to always be relying upon your spirit and your discernment and your guidance. I pray that um, you'll give us fortitude, though, uh, when it comes to the things that we can be certain about. So help us be loving uh, protectors and cultivators and cultivators of your creation. Help us take that responsibility seriously and also help us see it for the joy that it is. But most of all, I pray that you'll continue to work in us from the inside out, transform us, Father, into people that are characterised by love love first and foremost for you and then love of neighbour and I pray that um, through our changing hearts through our changing inward dispositions more and more we'll be um, again just better stewards better caretakers of your creation so um, again Father help us be people that just desperately want to be conformed to the character of your son help us more and more through your power and strength and with the assistance of each other Help us become the individuals that you want us to be, that again, in our own unique ways, are going to be characterised by the character and the love of Jesus. Amen.